And I never used to be able to recognize myself in mirrors. My brain would expect to see someone female staring back at me, but instead it saw someone that was male. Welcome everybody to this session. Uh, my name is Bobby Picard. I am a Global Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Director and also CEO of Trans in the City, which is the world's biggest corporate collaboration for trans awareness. I'm completely honoured to be here actually with the absolutely amazing Peter Tatchell, who I'm sure needs no introduction, um, but I'm sure um, shares the love of, of just about everybody that I've come across in the LGBTQIA community. I'm going to hand over to Peter um, to start this session. Thanks. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. I want to tell you that we offered to have a debate with a trans critic and we're told that no trans critic was willing to debate us. Uh, on Friday, Catherine Stock, a trans critic, spoke here alone unchallenged, with no trans person to debate her. I just think it shows that the people who demonize and vilify trans people often don't have the guts to put their views to public scrutiny and to face challenge from people who are trans who've lived the experience. I'm not trans, but I am a trans ally and have been for over 50 years. But I'm also a supporter of women's liberation as well. You know, women's rights are human rights, and I have supported hundreds of women's rights campaigns over the last five decades, both here in the UK and supporting women's struggles around the world. So for me, there can be no liberation without women's liberation. But equally, for the same five decades, I've supported the trans struggle for dignity, respect, and human rights. I see no contradiction between trans and women's liberation. They are two sides of the same coin. Both have my support. I, in particular, echo the views of many pro-trans feminists. These are feminists who also believe that trans rights are compatible with feminism. Um, I have opposed the transcritical views of people like Kathleen Stock and others. But I want to say that I do urge an end to the abuse and intimidation by some people on both sides of this debate. That is not helpful. We have to have this debate in a rational way. In my view, we have to challenge bigotry, but threatening people and abusing people is not the way to go. Um, I've also got to say that as a trans ally, Trans people get the worst, but as a trans ally, I get threats as well. I've had threats from people who claim they support feminism and oppose trans rights. I've had threats to have me killed, castrated, and raped, to have my home burned down. Now, that to me is beyond the pale, but it's nothing by comparison to what a lot of trans people face, which is why some trans people are not willing to have these debates because they fear the consequences, the intimidation and threats of violence and rape that they face. My starting point in this debate, I suppose, is that biological sex is a fact. It's a reality. But so too is gender identity. Both are real. Biological sex and gender identity are different, but they're equally valid. Trans women are women but they're not the same as other women. They are different from biological women, but that difference is legitimate. It should be accepted and respected. So I respect both biological women and trans women. Both deserve respect, dignity, and rights. Now, a lot of the trans critics argue that we have to maintain biological sex as the dominant issue in this debate. They say that biological sex is the basis on which women are oppressed. And that is partly true, partly true. In large parts of the world, however, women are also oppressed 
because they don't conform to the way women are supposed to dress, speak, and act. In other words, women are oppressed because of their gender nonconformity, not their biological sex per se. And this is very similar to the way in which trans people are oppressed because they don't conform to the expectations that go with their biological sex. In other words, trans people and many biological women are both oppressed because they don't conform to gender roles and stereotypes. Trans critics sometimes to me seem determined to police and reinforce a strict male-female divide rather than break down and overcome those barriers and divisions. Now, I happen to think that a sex and gender revolution would be a very good thing. I think historically, we've been put in boxes, male, female, masculine, feminine, you're supposed to behave this way or that way. That has been so oppressive. It doesn't give an understanding or an acceptance about individual diversity. I've been around so long that I was involved in supporting the women's liberation movement in the early 1970s. And one of the battle cries of the women's liberation movement five decades ago was, biology is not destiny. But now, some trans critics say, biology is destiny. It's a complete reversal of what the women's liberation movement stood for five decades ago. I think it's a very regressive step. Um, obviously, biology is a reality, but progressives should be doing everything in their power to limit its adverse consequences for both women and trans people. So as I said, like many women, many feminists, I stand with trans people. I support protection for them and for other women. Uh, it is totally right that we should be concerned about women's safety. That's an absolute thing that we should all be concerned about. That's a valid, valid concern. But it doesn't require or justify a blanket exclusion of trans women from women's spaces. The idea that all trans women should be excluded from certain women's spaces is based upon a preemptive assumption and in fact, a form of punishment or restriction based on who trans people are, not what trans people have done. The trans critic is saying, because you are trans, regardless of what you've ever done in your life, you should be excluded from these spaces. That's outrageous to punish and restrict people based on an assumption of what they might do or could do. Now, I've got friends who work in women's centers around the country, and I know several that have accepted trans women for, in one case, so far, seven years, with the agreement of the staff and with the women users. They tell me they have never had a problem of trans people in their women's center, never had a problem at all. So again, the idea that exclusion should be the presumption, which is what trans critics are arguing for, I think is not backed up by the evidence. Now, these women's centers vet all women users, and they rightly exclude anyone, trans or not trans, who acts in an abusive, threatening, or harmful way. You know, there is one woman's center where they did have problems. It was from a biological woman who was harassing other women in the center for sex. It wasn't a trans woman, it was a biological woman. And they dealt with that through the normal protection procedures. Um, when it comes to the whole issue about toilets, I mean, you know, trans women have been using toilets for decades without a problem. No one has noticed. There's never been an issue. But now suddenly it's a big, big issue. I mean, many institutions from the schools that I go to talk to, to Pride events, and even to GB News, which is not exactly trans-friendly, they all have gender-neutral toilets. 
You go to a pop festival, they're all gender neutral toilets. No problem. This is a hypothetical scaremongering that has no basis in fact, because those gender neutral toilets have lockable cubicles. So the women who use them are perfectly safe and secure. Now, obviously, there are some exceptions. So any person who claims to be a trans woman but presents with a beard or engages in sexual harassment or exposes male genitals in women's spaces, well, that's not on. They, they should be ejected. And if they're engaged in harassment, of course, they should be prosecuted. But so far, I haven't heard of, I've only heard about two examples where that's happened, two examples out of millions of instances around the world. People really are clutching at straw to use this as an argument against trans people. Um, sexual harassment and unwanted genital exposure that could cause offense is obviously wrong. It shouldn't be tolerated, regardless of whether it's perpetrated by a biological woman or trans woman. However, as I said, unacceptable trans behavior uh, in toilets or women's changing rooms has almost never happened. There have been a few instances, but only a few. And it's totally unrepresentative of how almost all trans women behave, respecting the dignity and sensitivity of other women. So let's not exaggerate based on a handful of examples where bad things have been done. If we look at women on women violence and sexual assault, much of it is perpetrated not by trans women, but by biological women. So I can think of instances where biological women have sexually harassed or been violent towards other women. Once again, there may be a handful of instances where trans women have done this, but in many cases, it is biological women who are doing the violence, the harassment, and so on. So obviously, any woman, including trans women, with a history of violent or sexual offenses against women should not be placed in the general population of a woman's prison. If they have a, this history and record of sexual or other violence, they should not be placed in the general population. The same as a biological woman. A biological woman who's a, a threat to other women should not be placed in the general prison population. Unless, of course, there is clear evidence that they have reformed. And we need to hold out the hope of redemption and reform to those who have done bad things. But even then, in a woman's prison, um, those people, trans or biological women, should be subject to monitoring and review, as would happen in every other case. You know, when biological women do bad things, they are put under supervision in a prison. Um, if there is evidence that a trans woman is an ongoing threat to other women, or a biological woman who is an ongoing threat to other women, they should probably be placed in a separate unit within a woman's prison. And they should not be permitted to mix with the general woman's population unless there is staff supervision. And this is the policy that's already adopted by many prisons anyway. And it doesn't just apply to trans women, it applies to biological women who have been guilty of violence or sexual assault. So what I'm trying to say is, when it comes to the prison issue, this is an example of how we can reach uh, an acceptable a way of dealing with these practical problems, where we can deal with the legitimate concerns about women's welfare and safety, but not have blanket discrimination against trans women. As I said, it's very wrong to demonize and exclude trans women based on what a few may do. In the same way, it's wrong to demonize and exclude all Muslims because a tiny handful are terrorists. Now, no decent person would say just because these handful of tiny, tiny handful of Muslims are terrorists that we should have restrictions on the whole Muslim population. But some people are saying that same thing when it comes to trans. Because a handful have done bad things, all trans women should be penalized. I just don't accept that because most trans women, the vast majority of trans women, are no threat or danger to any woman 
whatsoever. Trans women are not the enemy of other women. The fight by some feminists and some women against trans inclusion is a huge distraction from the very major inequalities and abuses that all women, including trans women, are at risk of. So we should be focusing on violence against women, including trans women, rape, harassment, domestic abuse, unequal pay, lack of affordable childcare, underrepresentation in senior positions in government and business, and the trafficking of women into sexual slavery and domestic servitude. Those are far bigger, more damaging issues. And I just look now and see how some feminists are putting so much energy into this trans issue to the neglect of these other issues that really have a far greater damaging impact upon women's lives. Um, you know, these are really serious issues and they should be the focus. Um, I believe that we should all stand together, whatever our biological sex or gender identity, to oppose sexist injustices as they affect women, including trans women. Let's not divide and fight each other. It weakens both the trans movement and the women's movement. The only people who gain from trans culture wars are misogynists, transphobes, religious conservatives, and the far right, all of whom back trans critical campaigners. And that ought to be a really major issue of concern. When I post in support of trans people, I get so much toxic hate. I can cope with it, but I look at who's doing it. I click on them and their profile. These are people who are out and out misogynists. They're anti-immigrant, they're racist, they're homophobic. They're just using the trans debate created by some trans feminists, anti-trans feminists, to further their own uh, extreme agenda. To me, we have to fight both misogyny and transphobia. Unity and solidarity, together we are stronger and together we all win. Thank you. What he said, should we go and have an early lunch? Um, I said before I was really honoured to be here and I am really honoured to be here. And, you know, I, I, I feel like I really shouldn't be here. And I shouldn't be here, actually, because 48% of trans people attempt suicide in their lifetime. 85% have some form of depression through their lives. 92% have suicidal ideation. Nine out of 10 trans people seriously consider taking their own lives. And that's nothing to do with us being trans. I've been trans all my life. I came to terms with being trans when I was about six years old. I've been perfectly fine with it ever since. What those figures reflect is our society not allowing trans people to be themselves not allowing trans and non-binary people to live their own lives how they need to live, how they need to survive. If there was any other part of our society that had anywhere near those figures, we'd be up in arms and we'd be trying to figure out why that was happening and trying to resolve it. Instead, we're in a situation at the moment where the only voices being heard are anti-trans people coming up with hypothetical, scaremongering stories and making the situation worse. And that situation is being made worse by online media. It's being made worse by print media. It's being made worse by the broadcast media. Peter gave a great example there of this great trans debate. There is no real trans debate because the only voices people are hearing are anti-trans people. And we've seen people like Kathleen Stock have their own session here at this festival just to say her point of view. And she's completely entitled to her point of view. I don't have a problem with her having her own point of view. 
but I've seen four or five speakers at this festival with anti-trans views, giving their points of views. The only trans person I've seen at this festival is me, and I'm here at the invitation of Peter to speak. So there is no debate. There's just far right-wing people and anti-trans people talking about trans people when they know nothing about our lives. I, like I said, have been trans all of my life. Being trans is a perfectly natural thing. We've known, we've seen the indications now for at least 70 years that it's caused by hormonal development or hormonal receptivity on the brain. It's as natural as being redheaded. Actually, it's about, when you look globally, around about the same amount of percentage of people that are redheaded that are trans. And all it means is that your biological sex and your gender identity, in simplest possible terms, the biological sex, the sex of your body, and your gender identity, the sex of your brain, are different to each other. And if you're not trans, and I know lots of people don't like the term, they don't like the label, cisgender is the scientific term, if you're not trans, um, loads of people don't like labels, and I completely appreciate that, I don't like labels myself. So if you're not trans, and your biological sex and your gender align, then you've probably never considered that they could be two separate things. You've probably never thought that they could be different to each other but they absolutely can. And if they are different to each other, then you feel the effect. And that effect that you feel, that gender dysphoria, that stress that you feel when you have your biological sex as one thing and your gender identity as another can be extreme. Your body always wants to bring itself into line with your brain. You, you know, it's nature. Nature always loves an equilibrium. You can't change your brain, but you can change your body. You can change how you express yourself and you can alleviate those feelings of gender dysphoria. In its easiest form for me, trans people and non-binary people experience gender dysphoria in different ways. In its easiest form for me, Gender dysphoria feels like that really horrible, sinking feeling that something's gone wrong. You know, you've gone through a speed camera and it's flashed at you. Or you've opened up an exam paper and you've looked at all the questions and you've realised that you can't answer anything. You know, that really horrible, deep, sinking, horrible feeling. You know, that feeling the night before when you're sitting in your motorhome thinking, oh God, I'm speaking in the hat tomorrow at 11 o'clock and I haven't got the foggiest idea of what I'm going to say. That type of horrible sinking feeling, that's gender dysphoria at its easiest. At its worst, it's made me physically sick. It's made me shake. It gives you such a feeling of disassociation. You know, we all have an internal vision of who we are. We all do. We all hold that within ourselves, who we are as a person, what we look like, our being. And I've had that all my life, like everybody else as well. But as far as my brain's concerned, I'm female. So I used to get up in the morning. I used to wander into the bathroom, look in the bathroom mirror, and my brain would expect to see someone female staring back at me. But instead, it saw someone that was male. And I never used to be able to recognize myself in mirrors, even to the point I used to wander around shopping centers, those big floor to ceiling shopping uh, mirrors that you see in shopping centers it used to take me two or three seconds to try and guess who I was in the crowd of people, mainly by, you know, the clothes that that person was wearing. That not being able to recognize yourself causes such disassociation. Because when your brain doesn't receive what it believes to be reality, then it assumes that you're dreaming. It assumes you're in a lucid dream. 
So it disassociates you from real life. You can't interact with people. You can't make that societal connection with people because you're not really here. 16th of September, 2016, after 35 years of, of suicidal ideation and, and lots of attempts, I found myself standing at the side of a road in Crawley on a humpback bridge um, on a blind bend where um, loads of huge, huge tipper lorries, you know, those really massive ones, uh, were coming to and from uh, a waste disposal site. I used to work in the most lovely areas. Um, and I just decided that I'd, I'd had enough. That pressure that's put on you by society and that pressure that you put on you yourself because you can't bring yourself into equilibrium was too much. And I stepped out in front of one lorry and just got the timing wrong. And the wing mirror clipped the, the, the front of my hair. And I was going to step out in front of the next lorry when I realised I hadn't written the songs out that I wanted for my funeral. And I'm a musician. I've always been a musician. And that was so important to me. I just wanted that one bit of my life to be me, to reflect the real me, to be the one bit of all of that 48 years of life where I could have said, here I am. And I stood at that road for a while and decided to go home and write out the list of songs and come back the next day. And I got halfway home and I heard a song on the radio. Um, and that, I think, made me angry enough to want to carry on. And that gave me an extra day and then an extra week and an extra month. And then after about nine months, I decided finally that I was going to transition. Or actually the choice I had was either to get on and kill myself or try to transition. And I decided that I may as well try transitioning because if it didn't work, I could always kill myself afterwards. So I did transition finally. And there's a whole story around transitioning there. You know, transitioning isn't just medical transitioning because of that alignment, that adjusting of the equilibrium that trans people always do they're always transitioning to some extent but i medically transitioned came out finally to the last few people that that didn't know and it was the best thing i'd ever done i went from having a bleak existence with no color in the world to seeing every single color on every single blade of grass and flower I get such joy from the world just by being in it, just by interacting with people. I used to be a person that couldn't walk into a room of more than two or three people because I was forever trying to hide who I was. And now I can stand on stage, sit on stage and talk to people like you. I can enjoy life. This is what you give trans people when you allow them to be trans when you allow them to transition you don't give them back their life you give them life you give them color you give them joy you allow them to flourish and isn't that that flourishing in our life isn't that what we all want isn't that what we want for ourselves isn't that what we want for other people isn't that what every single person in our society, in the world, deserves? Peter's so very eloquently given us the facts to debunk the myth. The real myth is that trans people are a problem. We're not. We just want to live. We just want to flourish. We just want to be part of the same society that you are. Thank you. Woo! Woo! For more debates, talks and interviews, 
Subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.